Esther 5, 9 through 14 is where we're going to be. There are some Bibles in the chair backs or chair below, I guess. And then if you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles in our Welcome Center. They're a blue, light blue Bible. Feel free to take one of those. It's your gift from us. We love to give Bibles away. Uh, I will gladly buy more Bibles if you take all of our Bibles. So you're not stealing it. It's a gift. Take it. If you know somebody who doesn't have a Bible and needs a Bible, take them one of those. It's a blessing. I have a bunch more in my office and I will replenish that supply until they are gone and then I'll buy them another case. So keep giving Bibles away. The more, the merrier. The number one most printed book every single year throughout the world for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It doesn't show up in the bestseller list because nothing else can compare. So praise God that we have his word. It's so plentiful. And uh, we get the chance to give it away and share it with people. Thank you for your generosity that I might do that. So that is awesome. Well, we are in uh, Esther, and we're going to be in Esther this week. And the next week, we're going to wrap it up. So if you've been enjoying Esther, sorry, it's coming to an end. If you've been hating Esther, well, good news, it's coming to an end. Uh, But And then we'll move into transition into some uh, Christmas-orientated stuff. I'm thinking the book of Luke over Christmas is where we're going to kind of focus this year. But as I said, Esther 5, 9 through 14, and we're looking at Haman today, and and it's kind of a comparison contrast, it's a a case study of sorts of the difference between Esther, who we kind of looked at a little bit last week, and Haman, who we're going to focus a little bit more on this week. And, And as we've looked at Haman, and we've talked about Haman, kind of the background of the story is, the story starts off with King Ahasuerus, and you don't probably know that name, it's King Xerxes is his Greek name. If you've seen the movie 300, he's that king in the movie 300. I don't recommend the movie, but if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. So King Xerxes, and then he had a wife, Vashti. He kind of kicked her to the curb when she wouldn't do what he wanted. He opened up kind of a like the Bachelorette on television, a show to uh, bring in some women to find his next wife. And out of those women, Esther is the cream of the crop. She rises to the top. She becomes the new queen of Persia. Well, within that, uh, she kind of... Whatever happens in the story, they've been married for about five years at this point. They're, they're in a lull in their marriage. She hasn't spoken to the king for 30 days. Uh, but along the way, her uncle slash adoptive father had heard of a plot that was set against the king. Two guys were planning to kill the king. So this guy's name is Mordecai. Mordecai tells Esther, the queen, you might want to tell the king um, there's some guys out to get him. King investigates. Sure enough, it's true. He has those two guys who are going to try to kill him killed. So you think at this point, then Mordecai, the guy who saves the king's life, he's going to get like the Rolex watch, the gold chariot, some sort of reward. But no, the guy we're talking about today, he gets a promotion, Haman. And the background on Haman is Haman's an Agagite. The Agagites are the arch enemies of the Israelites. They are the first group who ever went to war against the Israelites. And so they have this long-standing dislike for one another. And Haman gets this promotion. Mordecai is just like a city official, a servant, somebody in the government. And uh, Haman goes down to the city gates. He kind of erects this little throne for himself. He wants everybody who comes to kind of bow down before him. He, he thinks much of himself. Well, everybody does this, with one lone exception. And this guy, Mordecai. Everybody, every morning, bows down before Haman. But that one dude over there, just every day, Monday, he's still standing. Tuesday, he's still standing. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The guy won't bow down. What's going on? It starts to, it's like a rock in Haman's shoe, right? You ever had that rock in your shoe? How far can you walk ignoring it? Not too far, right? And that's kind of who Mordecai was to good old Haman. Well, Haman says, well, I don't like this guy, so I'm going to kill him. But not only am I going to kill him, I'm going to kill him. All of his people, all of the Israelites, all of the Jews, And he gets the king to sign off on this. And so we're talking a potential genocide of millions of Jews. And that kind of brings us into the story of of where Esther has finally heard of this. She's kind of isolated in in the palace. She doesn't know that this edict has gone out. And she hears word from her uncle slash father, adoptive father, that this plot is afoot. And so she sends word back to Mordecai and says, Mordecai, gather the people of God, the Jews, the Israelites that are here in the city of Susa. And for three days, you need to fast for me and probably pray as well. And after those three days, I will go to the king 
and see if something can be done. But the problem is, as I said, she hadn't seen her husband for 30 days. We don't know why, but it had been 30 days since they had seen one another. And the rule of the land was, if you go to the king and you don't have an appointment, off with your head. Unless he extends his scepter and allows you to touch it, then you have permission to talk. So you're putting it all on the line if you show up at his office one day and he doesn't know you're coming. There's an axeman standing behind him ready to chop. So Esther tells Mordecai, get the people together fast. Pray for me. And after three days, I will go. And she says, if I perish, I perish. She's willing to put her life on the line. All the way up until that point in the story, she'd kind of been at best wishy-washy in her faith. Nobody knows that Mordecai and Esther were, were Jews for most of the story. And it's at this point Esther is going to begin to out herself. She goes to the king. She says, hey, i got a request. Well, what is it, darling? You can have pretty much anything you want, up to half of my kingdom, he says. She says, let me cook you dinner. Well, okay. And that brings us up to where we are in the story today. So she cooks him dinner and invites Haman to come over to dinner as well. The guest list is two people long. King and Haman. Okay? And so because of this, Haman's, Ooh, hey, I'm special. I got on the list. I, I'm, I'm the right-hand man of the king. Right? They like me. I'm going places. He's popular. And, and Haman's identity is wrapped up in this public honor. He, he, he feels good about himself because of it. And so scripture says, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. Why? Because Esther, the queen, had invited him to be with the king for dinner. So he's made it. He's finally arrived, right? He's so important. He's so successful. He's made it. He's a big deal. People are noticing. He's never been happier, right? He's proud. He's walking with his chest up and out, right? Yeah, all right. Esther chose me to have dinner with the king. I'm with Xerxes the Great. I'm on his team. We're going places now. Imagine this was you, right? Like, your cell phone rings, you pick it up, hello, who is it? It's the president. You, you what? You want me to come to dinner? Oh yeah, this must be a big party, right? How many people are going to be there? What, what do you mean? You and me and your wife and nobody else? Wow. I'm honored. I'm, uh, sure. I mean, how long would it take you to say yes? Even if you don't like the president, if he called you to have dinner, would you say yes? I would. Right? And they're like, yeah, I'm just wondering if you'd come over. We're going to have dinner. We're going to hang out. Just you, me, and the wife. It'll be cool, right? How long would it take you to make that a Facebook post, right? And, and then after you show up at the White House, right, how long would it take you to put a photo of you and the president on Instagram? Not long, I bet, for most of us. But then it says, but when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, this is after the party, after they've been together for the evening, He's leaving, and it's kind of funny, right? He's leaving the party, the king, queen, and him. And who does he see that day? Oh yeah, that rock in my shoe. Like, like this is his high point day of his life, right? Everything's going great. Woohoo, I had dinner with the king. And he comes walking out of the palace, and who does he see? That one guy who's driving him nuts, right? You ever have days like that? Everything's going perfect, and then... Something happens, you see that person, your ex or whatever, and you're like, oh, this guy's driving me crazy, right? This is a guy who won't bow down to me every single day. He's out there protesting at the gates now. He's wearing sackcloth and ashes. He's yelling and complaining to anybody who will listen. Oh, this guy's driving me nuts. So what do you think at that point? Mordecai sees him. Haman sees Mordecai. What do you think? Is Mordecai going to bow, bow finally? Mm-mm. Mordecai is not going to bow. I mean, you would think at this point, with a death sentence on millions of people because of Mordecai, Mordecai might go, Oh, hey, Haman, nice to see you. I'm sorry about not that bowing thing. And, and let me make up for it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, hello, hello. Sorry, sorry. Let me bow. Let me bow. Okay, okay. I'm trying to save some people here. Let me bow, right? But no, he won't do it. He will not bow down. It says in Scripture, He neither rose nor trembled before Him. He's not bowing, folks. He's not willing to do it. 
even with millions of people's lives on the line. Now, as you read this, it's hard to tell. Was this wrong of Mordecai or was it stupid of Mordecai? Sometimes the difference is a very fine line, right? That it, whether you're wrong or stupid. If you have a wife, she'll usually let you know which side you fall on. That's my experience, anyhow. But stupid or courageous, which is he? And you can cross that line pretty readily. So what's Haman going to do? It says, nevertheless, Haman restrained himself, right? I mean, first of all, he's like, he's filled with rage against Mordecai. He's furious against him. He's unhappy. He's upset. He's like, Mordecai, oh, why's that guy got to be there and ruin my day? Everything was going great. Dinner with the king, queen. Now this dude. But it says Mordecai, surprisingly, was able to reserve himself, restrain himself. It says, even though he was filled with wrath against Mordecai, nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and he went home. And what does he do when he gets home? He sends out and he gets everybody to come and visit him. He says, the scripture says, they brought in his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And what's he going to do at that point? He gathers this crowd of people after seeing Mordecai and brings all these people in. What's he going to do? Well, let me tell you what he's going to do. So let me tell you what I did tonight, right? It says, Haman recounted to them. He bragged to them. Hey, if you didn't know, guess what? Who do you think had dinner with the king and queen tonight? Right? Not you, did you? Uh-uh. Mm-mm. How about you? No, you didn't. You were having turnips. I was with the king. We were in the palace. The queen cooked, and it was awesome. You ever eaten the queen's food? Ha! I knew you hadn't. Right? That's Haman trying to get people together so he can tell them how great he is. This, this guy has an ego. He wants to tell them his experiences from that night. So it says, Haman recounted to them the, the splendor of his riches. Right? And if we read this story, we can be very critical of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trying to make much of himself, right? But how often do we do likewise? How often do you ever find yourself telling somebody about the car you drive, Right? Or, or, oh, I found these really cute shoes, and oh, they were such a great deal. It said 75% off. They were only $200. It was a bargain. Right? Or we introduce ourselves with, oh, where do you live? Oh, you live in Ironton. Okay, now I know about you. Right? Oh, you're from Crosby? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm better than you. Uh, if you're from Aiken, that's what you think sometimes. Oh, you're from, oh... You're from Golden Valley. I'm from Wyzetta. Sorry, we're better than you. Twin Cities, right? We have those issues. Oh, you, you only, oh, you only live on that lake. We live on this lake. Right? That's the one up here. That's the big one. We have our own particular ways, but most of us have our ways of peacocking, of showing off, of, of telling people about our splendors and riches, right? Yeah, I like to brag about my 2002 Rusty Subaru Outback. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But we do. we do. We do it. Ask me about my motorcycle sometime, I'll tell you. And so Mordecai, it says, talked about the number of his sons, all of the promotion, promotions with which the king had honored him. And how he had advanced above the officials and the servants of the king. See, Mordecai really is puffing himself up. I am rich. I am powerful. I am important. I am so close to the king and queen. You're, you're actually lucky to be close to me right now. I, I mean, I was, I was this close to them tonight. That makes me tight. He's boastful, right? What does scripture say about the boastful? What does it say? It says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Which is kind of a foreshadowing for the way things are going to go later on here for Haman. Then Haman said, even the Queen Esther, that he doesn't know at this point is a Jew, even the Queen Esther, let no one but me come. The guest list was only one, just me. And then he goes on and he says, and you know what? Not only am I the only person on the guest list, she invited me alone. 
Me and the king. Nobody else. We're going to have dinner tomorrow night too. He's really got it going, right? The guest list of one. Now, as you think about this story and you think about him, Haman, he's modeling himself after King Xerxes. He wants to be like King Xerxes. See, at the beginning of the story, we learn King Xerxes has this mighty throne and he loves to sit on this throne and below this throne was a beautiful carpet and nobody was allowed to touch that carpet upon the punishment of death if you walk on his carpet. And everywhere that the king go, they would carry this giant throne. His, his soldiers would go into battle. They would find the highest hill. They would take that hill, plop down that giant throne so he could sit there and just watch the battles below him. That everybody could see him. He liked to be elevated above everybody else so that you knew you were below him. That's the way King Xerxes was. And he was the richest man, the most powerful man on the planet in that moment. And Haman... He wants to be like King Xerxes. Models his life after King Xerxes. King Xerxes, if he had a bucket list of who he could have dinner with, Xerxes was at the top. He idolized him, wanted to be like him. Who's that for you? Who would you, who would you choose? If you could have dinner tonight with any living person, who would you choose, right? Who would that person be? Would you pick Tom Hanks? Would you pick Oprah? Would you pick the president? Who would you pick? Who, who's that? Who's that rock star, that, that musician, that actor, that business leader? You know, I'd, I'd love to have dinner with Warren Buffett. That'd be really cool. We'd probably go to Dairy Queen. He owns Dairy Queen, if you don't know that. Well, his company. But who would it be, right? We all have those people we admire, that we idolize. And with Haman, it was Xerxes. Haman's like it. I've hit the lottery, the jackpot, everything I've ever dreamed of. Haman is excited. He wants to tell everybody how good and important he is. Verse 13. He says, yet yeah, all of this, all this stuff that I'm getting, all this experience, this blessing, this bucket list kind of stuff, yet yeah, all of this is worth what? He says, it's worth nothing to me. Why is that? This dude, Mordecai. When you have idolatry in your life, everything goes out of perspective and out of proportion. You get out of whack when you have idolatry in your life. And he says, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate, I can't be happy. Despite the fact this is the best day of my life, I can't be happy because that guy's down there. I've had the best day of my life ever and I still can't be happy. I mean, the king is my friend. I'm hanging out with him, dinner with him for two nights in a row, and I can't be happy. This one little pebble in my shoe is driving me nuts. How many of you are like that, right? You could be having the best day of your life, and you, you, one thing will go wrong, and it will set you off. Are you like that? And you get focused on the one bad thing instead of the many good things. We're in Thanksgiving week here, folks, right? That's a good reminder for all of us. This is coincidence. I didn't plan this sermon to hit today, but that's the way God works. How often are we amazingly and abundantly blessed? God pours out His blessing. we got so much great going on. And then there's just, just this one thing. And it, we, that's all we can see is that one thing. And it's driving us crazy. It becomes our focus. It consumes us. That's Haman. He's at the best day of his life, except for this one tiny little dude who is nobody, he's not important, he, he, he doesn't have any wealth, he doesn't have any family in town, he doesn't own much of anything, he, he's a nobody, and I'm a somebody, but still, this guy is driving me crazy. Right? He obsesses over this. He goes to bed thinking about Mordecai, he wakes up, Mordecai's on his brain. Right? Driving him nuts. That's Haman. And many of us, are, we're prone to this. We don't like to admit it, right? But many of us, we miss out on enjoying and rejoicing in God's blessing because there's that one thing, whatever it might be. It could be a big thing even. But we still don't see God's blessing. We get so narrowed, so focused on that one thing. And the issue is, 
Haman's idolatry. His, his idolatry is about himself, his ego. He needs to be respected. He needs to be honored. He needs the recognition. And when there's just one guy not giving it to him, that's enough to throw him off. It just so happens Mordecai hits that one nerve and exposes the idol in Haman's life. And that idol was public recognition of himself. So scripture tells us, then his wife Zeresh and all of his friends said to him, so they're going to give him some counsel, right? And, 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 and I would encourage you, ladies especially, give your husband counsel, right? But if he's an idiot, give him good counsel, not bad counsel. So they're going to counsel him, but what kind of counsel do they give? Well, these are friends who aren't probably the kinds of friends you should recruit if you want more really good friends in life. These are friends who are just going to tell him what he already wants to hear, right? If your friends in your life never disagree with you, they're not actually your friends. You might have to think about that one for a little while. might need to examine some of your friendships. But if all of your friends only say yes to you, only agree with you, they're not your friends. You need to speak truth. In love. But we still need to speak truth. And so he's got these people, his wife, these people who've come over to his house. They're, they're there. And it's just basically a bunch of yes men, right? So here's what they're going to tell him. Mordecai, Mordecai is your problem. Well, we've got a solution for you. This is what you're going to do here, Haman. Why don't you uh, get a gallows, right? And then what do they say? Make it 50 cubits high. Okay, what's a cubit? Well, give or take your elbow to your wrist. About a foot and a half, give or take, something in that neighborhood, right? Of a grown man. That's give or take, that's the cubit. So we're talking like a gallows that's 75 feet high. Now when we think of gallows, how many of you have watched old westerns? I love them, right? E even though they're never that well made, I could watch them all day. Gun smoke, bonanza, anything with Clint Eastwood with a cigar and a hat and a sombrero or whatever. I love them. And most of them aren't that good. But I like them. And so when you think of a gallows, you think of the gallows probably from one of those shows, right? You got like the wooden platform, the trap door, you put the noose, the rope around the guy's neck, and on down he goes. That's what we think of when we think of a gallows. These guys are saying, no, you need one that's going to put him like up where everybody can see. You're going to make an example out of this guy, right? A public spectacle. And that'll, that'll soothe your hurt. If you, he's, he's hurt your pride publicly, you're going to destroy him publicly. See, he didn't want him just to suffer. It had to be public humiliation. Let the, let the gallows be 50 cubits high. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. And then go joyfully with the king to the feast, they say. So tomorrow will be the perfect day. Not only if you get to have dinner with the king and queen, but if you basically crucify, destroy, kill, murder Mordecai. The scripture says, this idea pleased Haman, right? So he's happy again. And he had the gallows made. That's the story of Scripture. Have you ever read the story of Esther up close? Interesting. Scripture tells us, though, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. There's going to be an interesting twist in this plot. If you haven't read ahead, it gets interesting. You should know the Persians, the Persians were the ones that invented crucifixion. Did you know that? They invented it. It was the Romans who mastered it. The Romans were really good at it. They were the ones who killed Jesus as far as physically. And Haman wants to destroy Mordecai, 75 feet up in the air for everyone to see. This is Haman's idolatry on display. And you and I and everyone will form an identity. And if our identity is formed out of our idolatry, it will lead to our misery every time. That's the way it works. If you've read the Bible, you know idolatry is the problem in the Bible. Idolatry, worshiping, 
putting high the things that are not God. The great biblical counselor, David Paulison, says this quote. He says, the problem in the Bible is the underlying sin of idolatry. Every sin stems from that. And what happens in idolatry is we take what can often be a good thing, but we make it a God thing in our lives. We put it on a pedestal. We raise it too high. And what again is Haman's idolatry? It's his power, his control, his public recognition. He wants to be respected. He wants obedience. He wants people to defer to him. He wants to be made much of, just like King Xerxes. He'd call himself a leader. But really, he was just an idolater. Now here's what happens. When good things become a God thing, that's a bad thing. You should write that down. When good things become a God thing, that is a bad thing. Whatever it might be. Is it wrong for us to appreciate being honored? No. That's a good thing. The Bible even tells us children, honor your mother and father, right? Church members honor their pastor. That's a good thing. I'm not saying that just as a pastor. We're supposed to honor those who are put in authority above us. That doesn't mean we have to like them, but we honor them. We give them our obedience and we defer. And here's what happens. If you idolize one thing, you will demonize the other thing. That's what Jonathan Edwards, probably the greatest theologian in all of the history of the United States, talked about. He says, if you idolize, you demonize. So is the case with Haman. Haman has idolized himself. He's idolized this this race of the Persians. And what's he going to do? He's demonizing the Jews. That's how racism comes into being. Haman is going to idolize honor. And so he's going to demonize Mordecai because he won't honor him. Who, in fact, dishonored him. He idolizes public recognition. So he's going to demonize Mordecai for not recognizing him publicly. And what is he, he going to do then? He's going to make a spectacle. He's going to kill him in the most public possible way, 75 feet up in the air. Make him suffer. Make him pay. And this is the root of so much of our, our conflict and strife as humans. We think much of ourselves and demonize somebody else. America is great. They are awesome. Yes, America. Everybody else, garbage. Aiken is awesome. Crosby, Crosby, no, okay. Vikings are awesome. Well, that's true. Um, I don't know what to do here. <laughs> Packers? Uh, we're not going to demonize them today. But we do this. We do it jokingly with the Vikings and Packers. But we do this. We put one thing up here and idolize it, and we demonize the other. We idolize our income. We, we will look down on somebody who doesn't make money like we do. We'll idolize our position or our authority at work, and we can demonize those who didn't get the promotion that we got, right? That's the way we work. That's part of our brokenness and our sin nature. But then as we go through this story, it's an interesting point in the story here, because you see, Esther, we, we saw last week, started growing spiritually. She took on for herself for the very first time, said, I need to do something about this. They're going to kill millions of my people. Okay, I'm a Jew. I better go to the king. And we see in the story last week that Esther all of a sudden has godly wisdom. And she has patience. And and self-control. And and she has this wise plan that's looking out for the good of others. Which stands in contrast of, of Haman, whose plan is not for the good of others. And Esther's identity becomes that of a child of God. And we see Haman's identity as that of, of his performance before others for their perception of him. Haman's identity is idolatry. And when that happens, people defend that identity violently. We see this throughout the book of Acts. Wherever Paul goes, 
Wherever Paul goes, when people are threatened, when people are challenged, conflict comes because Paul is there and he's trying to challenge their worldview. Because Christianity comes along uh, to reset their identities, it upsets the apple cart. When, when Paul comes and he challenges their idols, he goes to Mars Hill and he says, I see you've made you know, all of these statues to all of your gods. Let me tell you about the one true God. He hits them at the root of their idolatry. Haman's idolatry, his sin, is caught up in who he is and who people think of him. And he is going to violently defend that. You oftentimes might not even know sometimes you've made an idol out of something, right? You've, you've elevated something. Maybe you've started dating somebody new. Maybe there's a boy you're interested in. Maybe it's a girl. All of a sudden, when something happens, that relationship maybe gets a little shaky, your whole world is set into a downward spiral, right? Because you've elevated that at a level you shouldn't have. Or maybe you've idolized your children. Oh, I got the best kids, the smartest kids. My kids, you know, you got, those, you got all the bumper stickers. He's an A honor roll student. He's National Merit Society. He's passed his driver's test in the first try. I don't know, whatever they say. Right? And when all of a sudden your kid does something that disappoints, when your kid doesn't live up to your expectation, when all of a sudden they make a mistake, now you're ashamed. Now you're broken. Now you're hurting. Now you're going to have a hard time giving that child grace because your identity was wrapped up in their success. And when they fail, you look bad, right? That's idolatry. And when your idol is fed, you're happy. And when your idol is undercut, you're broken. And this is true with Haman as well. This is true in our culture. So many things that are not God things, but are good things, are put to the level of God. And then they're disruptive. So what is your idol? What is your idolatry? If you're not sure, one of the easy ways is to follow your emotions. What makes you really happy? Okay, The things that make us happiest, which can often be good things, family, success, Love. Maybe you're growing spiritually. That can be a good thing. But when your identity gets wrapped up in it, look at me. I've memorized every book of the Bible. I'm better than you. All of a sudden it's become a bad thing. Right? What are you afraid of losing? Who are you afraid of losing? Where are you afraid to fail in life? What, if it were made public, would destroy you? Those are our idols. In the final line of 1 John, John says, Dear children of God, keep yourself from idols. That's the invitation of a loving pastor who wants the best for his people. He wants them to not use God to feed their idolatry, but to remove their idolatry and to be satisfied in their identity as children of God. And when we do that, that changes everything for us. And I have good news for you today. If you're here and maybe you don't want to raise your hand and say, yeah, pastor, this is my idol, but maybe something in your life has just gotten a little out of balance. You put your business at a place, you put your family at a place, you put your children at a place, you put your spouse at a place, you put that car that you drive, that bass boat you have, the house that you have, whatever it is, you've put it at too high of a level. The good news is you don't have to live with your identity in your idolatry. You don't have to. But you see in our story, Haman never changes. And that's sad. He never repents. And we're going to find out in the coming week. His life ends miserably, tragically, shamefully. And the very one thing he didn't want, it ends publicly. Because of his idolatry. Our idols promise, but they don't deliver. 
Now going back to Esther in comparison. Esther has had this change in identity. In the story, she's named two names, Hadessa and Esther. And for part of the story, she's like this bipolar girl. But now she's finally realized who she is. <clears throat> she understands her identity is as a child of God. Oh yeah, I am a Jew. I am of the chosen, the elect, the, the people of God. And because she finds her identity in that, she's able to start thinking of others, putting others first, willing to even put her own life on the line. And in a weird twist in the story, Haman, who wants to take everybody's life, is going to lose his. Whereas Esther, who is willing to lose her life, ends up saving the people's lives. So what's your idolatry? Idolatry is usually a good thing that you've taken to a bad place. Being healthy is a good thing. Being in a loving relationship is a good thing. Being married is a good thing. The Bible says, he who finds a wife is good. Children are a blessing. It's good to be a parent. Having a job is a good thing. It's a good and noble thing to do work. Performing well in school is a good thing. Maximizing your abilities is a good thing. Being artistic, athletic, intelligent, all those good things. Our idolatry comes when we take that good thing and make it a God thing. Let me close with this. Jesus gives us a better identity than those things of the world. Haman lived for his glory, but Jesus lived for the glory of God. Haman makes God's people his enemy, but Jesus makes his enemies his friend. That is good news, folks. Thank you, Jesus, that when I was your enemy, you made me your friend. Haman wouldn't forgive one man for one thing. But Jesus will forgive every man for anything. Haman was going to publicly sacrifice a man. Jesus was publicly sacrificed for man. Haman forced people to bow down to him, didn't he? Jesus invites people to come and worship him in love, not in duty and obligation. See, Esther waited three days to leave her chamber to go and talk to the king. Jesus waited three days to come from his tomb. Lots of parallels in the story. Esther was clothed in royal robes. But in Jesus Christ, we are clothed in the splendor and righteousness of God. The good news is, folks, we don't have to hold on to our idolatry. Jesus died for us to free us. And the great news of the gospel is that he loves you and he wants better for you. So if you're here today, something's had a hold over you, we're going to pray in just a little minute. And I would invite you to pray with us. Join us in prayer. Set it free and see what kind of freedom you can find in that. Following our time of worship, we'll have some folks, if you need prayer, come on up. They'll pray with you. But as you go this week, examine your life. What makes you happiest? And is it healthy? What is your relationship with it? Do you give glory to God and honor Him through your family, through your job, through your children, through your house, through everything you've been given? And if not, work on it. Ask God to work on you and see what amazing things He can do. Amen? Let's pray.